I thank you uh, very much, uh, first of all, uh, to the uh, Institute uh, for hosting me here today. I'm also uh, delighted to find myself in uh, beautiful uh, Dublin, in uh, gorgeous uh, Ireland. I, uh, I had been looking forward to coming here uh, since I represent Irish uh, interests at the bank. So I waited until uh, this month, and here I am. Uh, I've already had some uh, very interesting uh, discussions with both uh, my authorities, as we call them, and also with, uh, with uh, CSOs here, and uh, really look forward uh, to engaging uh, tomorrow with uh, Irish Aid in particular. I think it's an opportunity for me to say that uh, the role that Ireland uh, is playing uh, in development is uh, very well known, very uh, respected. So uh, thank you for hosting me. Um, the World Bank, I mean, there is a lot of talk nowadays about uh, global governance architecture. As you well know, I don't think that I have to expand too much uh, with respect to that in front of uh, this uh, crowd. And uh, today, I thought that I should perhaps begin by talking a little bit about how the World Bank has actually evolved uh, since, since its creation, since it is, after all, a uh, post-war uh, creation. Uh, and then uh, I will talk to you about uh, the transformation, the internal transformation of the institution so that it can continue to meet global challenges and continue really to be very relevant in many years to come. And I will end by uh, addressing uh, what the bank has been doing, uh, meeting, for example, the challenges of the uh, Arab, Arab Spring. I'll say a few words about uh, issues relating to um, food price volatility. Um, I will talk about um, conflict and security. H how is the World Bank to act in these countries that are perhaps the most challenging? And I'll say a word or two as well about uh, climate change, since uh, this is, I know, an area of great um, uh, interest. So um, the World Bank. I should begin by saying that uh, I walked into the World Bank building invested of my new uh, mandate last November. And in uh, the lobby of the building, how many of you have been in the World Bank building? You have. OK, so four or five of you have been. Have you noticed what is engraved on the wall, the left-hand wall of the bank as you walk in? It is engraved, a world rid of poverty, which is the core mission of the bank actually. And I have to tell you that um, I found this to be very inspiring. And just to share with you that all members of the bank uh, staff, as they walk into the building, get a chance to be reminded of, of what they're supposed to be working on every day. So if the bank is a rather uh, elderly institution uh, today, uh, the environment in which, of course, it must op operate has completely changed since uh, its inception. It's the development challenges are ever more complex. We live in an interconnected world. And of course, in many ways, globalization has changed just about everything. As well, I should mention this right up front. Um, the bank is composed, I mean, it's a large enterprise, 187 shareholders. And I have to be uh, frank. I mean, the so-called donor countries uh, are in experiencing some amount of constraints uh, nowadays. I think uh, sitting in Dublin, I don't have to sort of go on and on uh, about that. So ha how has the bank evolved as an institution since it was created? Well, the bank started really uh, with uh, the IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, which uh, mandate was to provide funds to support long-term economic development to developing countries in 1945. In 1960, the so-called IDA was established uh, as the agency of the bank to provide concessional financial assistance to the poorest of the developing uh, countries. To this day, 
It is the world's uh, greatest source of concessional financing assistance in the developing uh, world. Then in 1956, so it came a little bit before the creation of IDA, the International Finance Corporation was added to the group to encourage and support private sector activity in developing uh, countries. Now, I should pause for a moment here and tell you that when we speak about development uh, today, we talk more and more about the importance of looking at private sector development in the developing countries because we are very well um, conscious that uh, in addition to continuing to focus on core issues like education and public health and the need for good basic infrastructure, we also need to think about how are we going to support sustained economic growth. And there we see a very important role, of course, for the private sector. Then at the bank, we saw the creation of MIGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, which was established in 1988 to provide non-commercial guarantee for foreign direct investment uh, in uh, developing countries. Now, MIGA's relevance today is, is really growing. They've had the change of convention. Uh, this was just a couple of years ago. I'm looking to my wonderful Irish assistant in my office here. I think it was two years ago, the change in... Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, the advisory services as well that uh, MIGA provides to help countries to, to basically attract and retain foreign investment is considered as being a very important function. The World Bank Group also has something called ICSID, which focuses on dispute resolutions. So people will talk about the bank, the World Bank, it's really about the World Bank Group, which is the aggregate of all these different arms, if you wish, that I've been uh, just talking about. So there has been a process of change and evolution from a structural uh, point of view. And I think that um, the bank has been able, therefore, to, to really keep up with the times and develop itself in a way that has been able to meet challenges as they have uh, come uh, its way. I should say also that um, whereas the bank remains a very important lending institution, there is a new emphasis put on advisory and technical assistance. So I always like to uh, remi remind uh, my own uh, authorities uh, in Canada, and we've had the same discussion here with, uh, with the Irish uh, colleagues, that the bank is a huge repository of knowledge about uh, development assistance. And uh, communicating and sharing uh, that knowledge is, is also very, very uh, critical, um, as is the lending part. But the knowledge part is, in my opinion, very, very important as well. So um, if I had been here um, five years ago talking about uh, the World Bank, um, I probably might have faced uh, an audience uh, telling me, well, we look at uh, uh, the bank, IBRD, and, and we see that the lending is sort of on a declining uh, slope. Uh, you know, uh, many, many countries seem to be doing uh, uh, very well. Uh, the financial markets in the development uh, world uh, are doing rather well, they're growing, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, what of the bank? I mean, what is the absolute relevance of the bank? Then, of course, the global financial uh, crises uh, hit. Uh, we all know what happened with uh, private credit uh, markets. Uh, I think that some uh, countries, uh, obviously, in the developing world have done well uh, through the crises. Uh, many uh, have not. 
And I think that uh, looking back now, we can agree that the bank actually has served as a very important counter-cyclical uh, mechanism uh, through the crises. Um, in fact, I was just looking at the figures before coming here, and between July 2008 and April 2010, the World Bank Group uh, provided about $100 billion in financial uh, commitments. So um, I think that the bank through that period has really demonstrated that it had been able to be nimble, uh, to, to respond uh, quickly. And um, when we look at also the way that it ha was able to develop new programs, new facilities, I'm uh, certainly, as a relative uh, newcomer to the institution, uh, I'm quite impressed with the way that the, the bank has reacted to the situation. So um, as we look uh, at the bank, uh, a question we can ask is, Fine, uh, the bank, I've said, has been able to evolve structurally. The bank has responded very well during uh, the financial crises. Is the bank thinking long-term about what about the future? Uh, how is the bank going to remain a very relevant part of this global um, aid architecture? And here, I want to tell you that the bank has actually embarked on quite a modernization agenda, uh, of which I would like to share the main highlights uh, with you. So the, the so-called governors of the bank uh, in 2010, so it's just a bit over a year ago, agreed uh, on a modernization agenda, uh, which is really uh, based on uh, four main points. Four or five, I'll go through them uh, with you. First of all, they've agreed on what is called, we call it PCD at the bank. It's a post-crisis uh, direction uh, strategy. And they basically agreed that going forward, the bank uh, should uh, focus on, on five main objectives. Targeting the poor with a greater focus on social protection systems, gender, conflict, and fragile sales states. I'll come back to that a bit later. Creating opportunities for growth, targeting investments in infrastructure agriculture, improvements in business climate, a sharpened focus on regional integration, and promoting global action by building capacity to provide and manage global public goods. The second element is really looking at governance within the, instru the institution, uh, acknowledging the importance of country systems, learning from impl implementation, building the role of the bank as a catalyst, and finally managing risk and preparing for crises. We've looked at voice uh, within uh, the bank, and uh, later on I'll say a few words about what does a director do anyway at the bank. Uh, and we created last year a third chair for Africa, uh, which is uh, very significant uh, in the context of uh, participation uh, within uh, the bank. The bank also has a new uh, access to information policy, which is part of transparency and making sure that there is a high level of disclosure of, of information at the bank. There was also, uh, you might be aware, an agreement on a general capital increase uh, at the bank. And uh, we closed, uh, just uh, this past December, a very successful replenishment of IDA. Uh, where actually the bank was uh, able uh, to raise uh, nearly uh, $50 billion. So um, another aspect of modernization is, um, is modernizing uh, internal business practices uh, with a view to um, increasing the integration of knowledge, accountability, flexibility, looking at the safeguards policies, and of course, HR uh, practices. So I guess my message here is that the bank is firmly embarked on a modernization uh, plan. Uh, it is really keeping up uh, with the times. Uh, it is results oriented. Uh, I myself uh, sit on the Committee on Development Effectiveness, and I can assure you that uh, we are very taken up with the issue of effectiveness and impact uh, of what we do. 
So, a world rid of poverty. Where are we at today in terms of, of development, I think is a legitimate question to be asking ourselves. Uh, I think that we're just sort of four years and a bit um, to um, millennium goals. Um, and if you were to look at all of the MDGs one by one, uh, it's always a question of, is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? Uh, I'm an eternal optimist, and I will say that actually very good progress has been achieved uh, globally in terms of uh, development. But the reality is that there are still uh, many countries that have uh, some way to go in achieving the targets that have been set out by the international uh, community. So um, I think that uh, it is very much in the spirit of wanting to do more, to do better, more quickly, uh, that we are looking at policies and programs uh, because we do believe that in this world that we're in, uh, we simply cannot afford uh, to have a growing uh, number of countries being laggards, if you wish, in terms of, uh, of development. So an aspect that I think we have to be uh, very uh, realistic about is that there isn't a single institution, a single um, donor country that is going to be able to achieve uh, the goals of development uh, working alone. So a very important aspect of what the World Bank does is actually to work in partnerships. And we have a number of new elements uh, coming into the development, uh, if you wish, uh, agenda or the development arena uh, that are, for my part, uh, very uh, positive developments. First of all, we have the arrival on the scene of non-traditional uh, donors, uh, as you would know, uh, who are actually um, uh, very interested in making a contribution, and some of these uh, non-traditional uh, actors are already uh, working in very close association with the bank. The bank has been working with foundations uh, uh, more and more, uh, and you would know of major projects in the public uh, health uh, sector, uh, for, for example. Then, what I would like to move to are the four areas where I, I thought I should say something because they really concretize for an audience what, what the bank actually has been up to most recently. Um, Middle East and, uh, and North uh, Africa. We've all followed uh, with a great deal of uh, interest what has happened in that part uh, of the world uh, in the last uh, uh, several months. Uh, I was just uh, saying that uh, many books, should I say, have been written already or are being written or will be written about what has happened uh, there. Uh, I think it will be considered as having been a bit of a, a, a watershed, uh, certainly for the countries uh, involved. Um, what we saw, of course, uh, was a, a sort of grassroots uh, movement leading for a call, really, for, for better governance and asking for pretty profound uh, change uh, to the landscape uh, in those countries. So, as against that, uh, the mobilization, if you wish, of the international community um, has been a very important element of, of support to these uh, new uh, governments, many trans uh, transitional now, as they struggle uh, to find a, a way uh, forward. And the bank has played a very, very uh, positive role in this regard, sitting down with the African Development Bank, the European uh, Bank, uh, EU, many bilateral countries, and trying to bring together a framework of, of action as to what can we actually do as the international community uh, to support uh, the Middle East and, and North Africa on the way uh, forward. So we have looked at issues of governance uh, very much, looking at uh, transparency, institution buildings, how we can help with uh, building more accountability 
uh, in, in the institutions, issues of social justice, inclusive growth, of course. How can we help develop sustainable economies? And there I would say the role of IFC, for example, will be absolutely um, important as a catalyst moving uh, forward. Trying to establish sustainable social protection systems, which we're lacking. Looking at issues of food, food price volatility. And also trying to come up with some innovative approaches to regional economic integration, which simply hasn't happened in that part of the world. So uh, you will have heard what came out of, uh, of the G7, G8 discussions not too long ago with respect to, um, to the Middle East and North Africa. This is not over by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but my assessment is that the bank really has played a very catalytic role, and stay tuned, there will be a lot more uh, to come. Let me turn briefly to the 2011 World Development uh, Report, and this is my item on conflict security and development. Some of you may be aware that uh, once a year, uh, the, the World Bank puts out what I call a seminal policy piece. Uh, this last spring, it was on conflict security and development. Why put a lens on that? Well, it is as a result of um, some amount of frustration that the efforts, the collective efforts of development in those so-called fragile and conflict states simply had not yielded uh, the, the, the results that uh, the international community was hoping for for many years. The report, uh, which I really commend, at least you, you tried to read the, the summary of, if you're interested in the, uh, in the issue, really focused on, on six themes and sets of recommendations going forward. That making country strategies more fragility focused was really important uh, for the bank in terms of identifying the stresses, the capacity gaps, and the opportunities to break cycles of violence. And that's, that's not easy to do. Secondly, that strengthening partnerships on development, security, and justice, linking with the greater aid architecture in the context very much of Paris and Accra, was also critical. That there should be increasing attention paid to jobs and private sector development, uh, identifying core products such as microfinance and SME management. That we needed to realign results and risk management framework for fragile and conflict states. And that, finally, we should be seeking less volatility in financing and providing necessary assistance to address governance issues on the longer term. And here I'll pause a little bit on this. The issue with so many uh, countries coming out of conflict or fragile states is that it takes a very long time to build the governance or the institutions. So, you know, out there in the, in the business world, we uh, always use, uh, we often use a phrase saying, it is important for capital to be patient. I think in the context of development, when we look at post-conflict and fragile states, we have to be very patient in terms of our efforts. And this sounds like something simple to say. In practice, it is not something that is simple to implement because the building of institutions in these countries require a very long-term sustained effort. And it is a matter of several step, steps forward and some steps back. And I think that there is a sense that uh, maybe we haven't gone at it quite the right way and that in any event, we should be uh, much more committed for a longer period of time when tackling uh, these issues. By the way, the next World of the Development Report is going to focus on, on uh, gender issues, so I really look forward to that. Let me move uh, very quickly to uh, food price volatility, food security. I'm addressing uh, you today at the same time, I think, as the farm ministers, the agriculture ministers are meeting in Paris in the context of the G20. You will have heard in all the headlines of all the papers over the last several months that uh, there is a real uh, issue around uh, food price volatility. I think that uh, world food prices have gone up by about 37% in the last 12 months, 
with all the negative impact that you can imagine this is having uh, on, on, on development. Um, so um, what kind of role uh, can the World Bank play in this regard? What has it been playing? What, number one, let me say that I have been very um, impressed uh, with the degree of energy that President uh, Zelik has, has uh, taken on this issue, ha has really made it uh, his issue, has been speaking about it uh, very uh, frequently, uh, putting it, frankly, top of mind in terms of policy makers and, and political level. And that's a very important role that the head of an institution like the World Bank uh, can actually play. And then looking at uh, uh, programs and policies, of course, the World Bank is involved in a number of initiatives and programs that, that sort of try to drive at the heart of this issue. And it, it, it spans the whole continuum. Uh, the World Bank is really uh, involved in supporting science, which is going to, of course, lead uh, to better uh, solutions in terms of agriculture in, in the world. Uh, of course, there are short-term responses in terms of the provision of grant and concessional uh, lending through the Global Food Crisis Response uh, Program. Then you have on the private sector side, the IFC, which is really um, uh, has developed and is, is going to manage a facility called the Agricultural Price Risk Management Facility. And then we're looking, <coughs> excuse me, also at, at um, uh, the management of donor grants for agriculture through the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, which was created as a result of the last uh, uh, G20. So there are many different areas where the World Bank can and is playing a very positive role with respect to this very um, difficult sort of a nugget. Uh, let me then uh, uh, talk very briefly about uh, climate change. Obviously, uh, we should all be concerned about issues of climate change, but uh, as, as you well know, climate change uh, is expected uh, to have a particularly uh, negative impact on many uh, developing uh, countries. I have to tell you that in addition to having the great privilege and pleasure of representing Ireland, I have as part of my constituency as well 11 Caribbean states. So uh, when I look at uh, the, the, the potential impact of climate change and uh, of natural disasters, uh, this is something that I have to contend with uh, every single day in the context of managing my constituents' uh, interests. So the bank has already put in place a, a, a number of very interesting programs to, to look at this, to, to, to be able to provide a response uh, the World Bank has a global facility for disaster risk reduction and recovery. I think that in addition uh, to, um, to uh, wanting to have longer term uh, policies looking at, at uh, climate change, it's important for the bank uh, to help build uh, immediate resilience uh, within these countries where you are seeing, uh, you know, uh, already the impact uh, of, of climate change. Um, both IFC and, and MIGA, of which I've, I've spoken about earlier, have also developed uh, climate change uh, strategies and incorporating uh, that aspect into their, their business uh, plans. So there are a number of new and innovative financing uh, mechanisms like the Climate Investment Fund, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, uh, which are really um, uh, catering, if you wish, to, to climate change uh, issues. So um, I guess in closing, some, um, some sort of final thoughts on the bank after my uh, tenure of, of now uh, seven months. I think uh, the bank is, is really um, stepping up uh, to the plate in terms of uh, global development challenges. I think that it is still an absolute premier institution when it comes to knowledge uh, on development uh, issues. Uh, the level of uh, commitment uh, and expertise that I have found uh, everywhere uh, from a geographic point of view, from a, a functional thematic point of view is, uh, is uh, frankly extremely uh, impressive. 
The bank is very well aware that we are no longer in a world where all the solutions are ne necessarily going to come from the north towards the south. There is a, a real interest and, and necessity to look at the experience of the south and take that, exper that experience to other countries in the south. We call it the south-south the uh, transfer uh, of knowledge. Innovation uh, is obviously going to be absolutely key on a forward basis. I know that we speak of innovation all the time, but innovation and development is also absolutely uh, critical. I have spoken of partnerships, absolutely central. I have said it. I think that in as much as uh, development, global uh, development is, is truly uh, a challenge that is huge. It cannot be resolved only by one uh, institution, so partnership absolutely uh, important on, on uh, a way uh, forward. I, I think it would be, um, rem I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that uh, the one thing also that we need to be very, uh, uh, very uh, aware of is that um, Voice is is critical. We uh, we deal, of course, with with governments and, and the programs at the bank. We um, we devise, we construct, we design the country assistance uh, strategies very much as a result of a dialogue with governments. But we also do very broad consultations with with other elements in the countries where we um, where we uh, work. And uh, the president has spoken a lot recently about um, the importance of reaching out uh, to civil society, to uh, the importance of re reaching out to, to citizens and the work uh, that we do. He's certainly spoken about that a lot in the context of, of uh, the Middle East and North Africa, how you need to, to give a voice and, and listen to the, to the many uh, voices. In fact, in his, uh, I think it was in the Patterson Institute speech, um, he concluded, uh, <clears throat> and I have a little quote from him here, that uh, 2011 might well be the year we learned that civic participation matters to development and that in addition uh, to regimes of governments, something more uh, has, has changed, which I thought was, was a very interesting way of concluding his speech. So I thought that I should perhaps conclude my little address uh, here uh, this way. So I hope that I have uh, given you um, the, the impression that A, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, my, my tenure, uh, B, that I fundamentally believe that what we do matters hugely. Uh, C, that the bank is, is a very relevant and uh, extremely competent in, institution in this regard, and that um, there is a role for Ireland to play uh, in this uh, architecture and, and within the bank, and it's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to talk about these issues with you today. Thank you, today. Very, thank thank you. you very much indeed.